Welcome guys, we are here, it is episode 4 of How to Build Your Club on So Rare. In this episode guys, we're going to be talking about market pieces, okay? We'll go into in a lot more detail in the video, but these are guys, and these are, this is a situation when you're building your club, you should be forward planning for, for when new clubs on board, or for when um, potentially, you know, just new cards become available that you're interested in, whether it be an upturn in forum, this kind of thing. These market assets are what's going to help you step into the market with ease and you know go and help you grow your club. As always guys if you do enjoy the video please make sure you do like, subscribe and share and retweet and all that good stuff. If you haven't joined so rare yet and you've found this video there's a link down below so you can open your account and get all the free stuff that's going so you can start on the best foot possible. Um, I hope you enjoy this one guys and let's get stuck into it. Now, like I said in the intro, um, market assets are a, it's basically a, a card that is very good in SO5 that has also got that kind of gravitas in the market, but it is, it's a very consistent card. It's maybe a, a player that is regularly in the team, can be on set pieces, could be a goal scorer, could be a solid centre back, could be a variety of things, okay? But when you're picking up these guys that are just SO5 players, they've not got any kind of collectible ability. You want to try and steer yourself towards the ones that do have some sort of profile in SO5 arenas, you know, whether it be a good history of um, being on leaderboards or good last 15 averages, last 5, last 40, whatever kind of metric um, pops out for them. Now, I was actually between, so there, this is kind of a double header episode, there's going to be a, a counterpart which will be episode 5 of the How to Build Your Club So Rare series and that is going to be called Assets, okay, so... I might kind of refer to that in a little piece here and there. Um, if it doesn't make sense, just make just wait till that part comes out and I'll clear it anything up that's um, maybe not too obvious. But I was also really close to recording a video with you guys now going through um, all of my direct offer history because after we did the one year anniversary stuff, I thought, you know what, that would be really interesting to go through all my direct offers um, and see what mistakes I've made, what good trades I've made, whatever. And as I was doing that to prep for the video, I said, you know what, the content that's here in terms of the data, the information, actually would serve these videos that I'm talking about, the the market uh, the market assets one, and uh, the market pieces, I beg your pardon, and the club assets video. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll kind of be going through my direct offer history across both these videos. You'll be able to see all the mistakes I've made, you'll be able to see some great trades I've pulled off. And hopefully it gives a wee bit more context towards the sort of stuff I'm talking about. So, yeah, without further ado, let's get stuck into it. So, these are the first little clutch of offers that I sold cards with that I thought this would make some good reading for the video. Now, all these trades from Nyangbo down to Vandiver all kind of took place around, I want to say, late to mid-December. All the way through to like early January. I know Van der was an early January sale. Now you can see how much I've sold them for ETH wise here. 0.14 which was an absolute crime. Now what I didn't realise when I released this Van der at the time was uh, he didn't have at that moment in time 2021 season cards. And I was only using them for training and he was nowhere near the team. He hadn't really done much for me. Uh, Pat LaRouche still has him. Yeah the 10th of January is when I sold that. As you can see I only paid odd pound for him. And I sold them, I bought them for a third of an ether. When I sold them off, um, you know, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what fee it was at, at the time, but I definitely made fee on it, even though the 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 ETH price had, had furthered, it turned into a further the price, basically. Um, but that was a, an ETH grab. I was going towards it. You guys will be able to check out the gallery. We can probably do it. In fact, just as easy as well. But um, what I picked up in January... The 12th of January, to be exact, was Lucas Nemeka. So this kind of funding round, if you like, uh, to use a nice kind of financial phrase and repurpose it for, for my own agenda, um, was to get my ETH together for my Lucas Nemeka. So uh, the the, La, the Nyangbo, the Reina, and the, the Lucimi, all those four cards I just named there, and the Bocadi, in fact, all of them were rewards that I'd picked up. So I didn't necessarily buy those guys, okay? Now, the mistake I made with the Reina is I didn't actually realise Reina had come into the team over Strakosha. And I seen this trade come in, I thought, I've got a wee bit of ETH. I like Demerbe. The Jose Aya was just a bit of crap, basically. And um, that was not a really a good trade to be pulling off. If you consider the prices that Reina has went for between January to today, there would have been multiple better opportunities to sell them. The Richie Delat 
what I tried to do with that was it was tra the, the trade came to me and I thought yeah do you know what well I won him and he's done me he's done me well in SO5 um, but he's like over 30 I think he'd been knocked out of Europe by that point or would only have like one more game in Europe and I thought Korea yeah he's a bit younger I actually quite like Korea he has the same guy still owns him um, and you know maybe that'll be an upgrade in my team but I say Korea in a champion Euro midfielder like that I also didn't realise as well this is why guys as well I can be a wee bit unscrupulous you know whenever we're talking about stuff I'm like hey listen if people are putting offers in for stuff they need to know they need to do their research because when I completed the trades for Delat out and Korea in Korea had just been diagnosed with Covid and I wasn't aware of it and Pepe Reina when I traded him out and brought these guys in again I was not aware that Pepe Reina was likely to become the starting goalkeeper for a period of time. So I really let myself down with both of those trades and I really shot myself in the foot. And um, I really should have known and done better. I then sold the Hakimi off. I sold Hakimi for the price I did because quite simply, I just got the super rare about a week or two ago and that was like half of the price of the super rare. So I thought, brilliant, I can re release the rare and then the super rare is kind of half taken care of. And then with this pair, right, you only see me in the Dorsch. Now, both of these guys, this is interesting, right? So, at the time, and I might be, you, you can go check so rare data, right? But about early mid January, I think Lucimi was listed up about 0 0.2 ish, and Dorsch was going for, um, no, I think Lucimi was about 1. 1. 1.8, 1. 1.4 around that kind of category, and Dorsch was down at about a quarter of a coin. And I didn't really value Lucimi as high as the market did, and I valued Dorsch much more than the market did. So by pairing both of those guys together in a deal, this guy Crack thinks he got a great deal, and he definitely did, but I felt I was getting a good rate for my Dorsch at that moment in time, who'd fallen out of form a little bit. It was a big purchase for me, and the Lissimi was a high-valued reward because he's you know a boss of a CB. Uh, a CB. Um, since this Crack guy's had him off me, guy, uh, this Lissimi has done the rounds. He's been here, there, and everywhere. Uh, his XP is not actually too bad considering, I suppose. Um... But making a deal for a Lucimi and a Dorsch at about half a coin at any stage, depending on you know whether where they are in terms of form and the calendar and all that kind of thing, is a trade that can activate some ETH for you and actually release it from you know the club. If that makes sense. All these cards I'm showing you in this little example. There's my little Dorsch number eighteen. Who's he with now? Potter. And again, since cracks had him, he's put him on the merry-go-round, and off he's went through everyone and anyone. Um. But these guys are much easier to release in terms of I can put a message in the Discord, I can list them on the market, and I know I'm going to get inquiries, and I know I'm getting going, going to get offers. So when I see that Super Rare in the Mecca, for example, uh, getting listed on the market, and I'm thinking, shit, I would love that. Good chance it's going to go cheap. How can I get that amount of ease together? Then I've got cards that I can release onto the market. I've not got duds, I've not got shite. It takes forever, and I need to really take a big hit on to release them. And then I didn't even I wouldn't I might not even get the auction because I've not released enough ETH and then I've got egg on my face because I've released cards I didn't really want to sell because they're good SO5 cards and Delat, Niangbo, Reina, Hakimi, Lucimi, Dorsch, Bokadi. Bokadi I really do regret selling him for the price I did because he is a CM who had ended up playing centre back for a while and his scores got ridiculous for a while and I really did um I really did regret selling him if I'm honest. Um, it was still a good guy, but it was to unknown NFT, it looks like, so I don't mind um, <laughs> seeing that he got a good home for a little while. But um, that was definitely a sore one, because he could have been very good for me in, in Challenger Europe or even Global. Um, but I, I would say this whole page, guys, is full of mistakes. All these guys, I could have sold for much more money, I could have held on to a little bit better. But if I did hold on to them in Minyana and wait, and oh, they'll come good one day, then I wouldn't have got that in the Mecca when I got them, and I might not have ever got them, and I wouldn't be sitting with a card that is as powerful and that I like as much as that, you know. And it's made easy, as I say, because these guys are SO5 performers, and most of them are in the Belgian League, you know. They're not champion Euro cards, they're not Champions League playing cards necessarily, and they're not really internationals to speak of either. They're all just good run-of-the-mill Belgian League players, you know. And guys, like I said at the tip off of the video, guys that have a good SO5 profile, are always going to have a demand in the market because guys are always looking to improve their SO5 standings and their, their ratings, you know. Now this little page has a few stories on it, okay. So as you can see at the top here from Zima Blue, he had picked up my Efra Alvarez through a direct offer for 0.472. I think I've mentioned this to you before, 
But that offer came in, and I kind of ran it past the group, a few of the group chats, and I'm like, oh, do you know what? I'm really excited for it for next year, but this is a decent offer, and I'm kind of hunting down some stuff. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? Um, as you can see, I picked up the Ephra for 0.413, it would seem, um, which was £121 at the time. And I managed to sell them on to my man here, Zima, for how much ETH? Where does he went? 0.472. So I managed to make a wee bit of ETH in terms of the fiat price as well. It changed dramatically since I picked them up. And then I went and picked up another Ephra Alvarez for 0.35. So I was actually able to... And that happened like within seconds. Another effort had come on the market simultaneously to this guy's direct offer. And he's just missed the boat basically on somebody listen, some five minutes after he's been scouting the market. And I was able to accept and do a bid within seconds of each other and basically churn out 1.2 ETH out of thin air. I'm sacrificing my 3 out of 10 Ephra, who at that point had trained up really well. And I think now I've got like 8 out of 10. And like the, I've managed to build up his multiplier a little bit, but the 3 out of 10 his multiplier would have been much bigger had I held on to that. But again, when you get direct offers for these pieces, sometimes it is important to maybe just scout into the market. And maybe see if there's something that you can do. Do you know, we were speaking on the live stream last night about the Sephirovich principle, do you get a direct offer like that? And you're like, Jesus, man, that's a lot of money for that guy. That guy's not really that good. I don't think that about Ephra. If anything, it's the opposite. I think he's got a great deal and I think I've managed to get a steal on the market. Um, but do you have a guy like that in your club you're getting an offer for and you're like, you know what, that is an amazing offer. This guy's form's about a tank or he's suspended the next match and he's due an injury soon. He always gets injured. He's never fit for long, whatever. Um, so that's Sephirovich principle if you can kick that in against a direct offer then you can bank some ETH wait to get them cheaper and you basically churn something out with the Dorsch for example that I just showed you a moment ago the way I equated that in my head was I sold the Dorsch for point um, for point um, what was that I'd said to myself was it point three two, and then the Lucimi was point one five, um, because I think yeah Lucimi was going for I think Lucimi was must have been going for about point one eight or something. Like that. But I say the guy at the time had valued Dorsch less than what I valued him at, but he valued the Lucimi more than what I valued him, and I, val I valued him less than what even the market did. But I, I actually have picked up another Dorsch for point one two five. So um, this Dorsch here, well, let's examine this quickly for a second. This Dorsch I picked up for about half a coin. I want to say. Um, This Dorsch I'd picked up for, yeah, about half a coin, £150 at the time. I then managed to sell him along with the Lucimi for basically break even. The Lucimi was a reward. And then I managed to pick up another Dorsch for 0 0.123 or 0 0.125 or something. Um, so again, you know, waiting for these opportunities to reappear or for them to open up for you. If you've got the patience, you know, fair enough, I've missed like half the season with Dorsch. But that was quite fortunate because the second half of the season for Dorsch was kind of shit until the Euro Under 20, 21 competition we did really well. Um, I've also then, from Zima Blue again, he sent me a direct offer from a Fabio Silva. And, you know, I had been begging, begging to sell Fabio Silva for a little while because I was really excited to have him. I'd love to have the card back in my club, don't get me wrong. Um, for his obvious like superstar potential and it's a rookie and all the rest of it, but um, I couldn't turn, I couldn't say no to that. I'd been trying to sell him for less prior to the boom, and when that offer came in, I didn't even think twice. I was like, yeah, on you go, you can have him. Uh, I picked up a team away uh, as a reward, and I managed to sell him uh, to Sean Newman. I think his name is the the guy, the the Draft King guy that was on Rotowire and did the podcast recently. But this is the thing I really wanted to pull up on this page. Okay, so Paulo Lopez, I've not got the first... So this is the second Paulo Lopez I owned. The first one I managed to pick up for, I'm going to say about 0.2-ish and sell for about half a coin. It was in and out of the team, as you'll know, from last season. I then managed to pick up this one for 0.2 again. So I think I'd made, managed to make a profit. I think I must have sold the last one for about 0.28 and creamed a bit of ETH, so I was able to pick up another one cheaper than what I'd sold my last season Per Lopez for, and as you can see, I was able to sell him for a, a flush coin, you know, a full ether. and then right after that, I think um, his form and whatever might have returned to the way it was, but trading in and out of goalkeepers, especially guys like Per Lopez that do have a market presence, you know, they are good goalkeepers that can get good scores, if you can, can pick them up cheap and move them on, for profit this page has got a, a bit more success in it than the last one <laughs> um then you can see again how i've easily managed to i say easily in inverted commas of course because i've had to buy these cards in the first place which has cost money but between the ephra let's just say i creamed off 
1.2 from Ephra. Forget that it says 4.47 there, right? 1.2 from the Ephra. 6.2 from the Fabio. So what does that get me? 7.3. Let's call it 7.6 with the rounding up, okay? And then this ETH here, that gets me 1.7. So when did the Pearl Lopez go? Let's just see. Pearl Lopez moved on the 12th of March. So there's the effort at that I'd pulled in. So you can see there exactly how much I've gotten for. A bunch of that ETH would have went towards the Jordan Larson. I also put a bit of that ETH probably towards getting the OG Vandevoort for half a coin as well when that happened. But also when I've released the Pearl Lopez for like an ether, I went and picked up Odysseus and Garbage. Um as like training goalkeepers, Odysseus is a bit of a sleeper in the sense that I expect him to fill the Paul Lopez kind of gap in the gallery, if that makes sense. Uh, and then Koopmans and Katarski, I think as well, I'd also done the Stecklenberg trades, if you remember them, um, and amongst this period also. So I was able to put the goalkeeper money back to work and keep it kind of in the market, if that makes sense. Um, I don't think it really out and out went towards uh, a super rare as such because this Jordan Larson came through on the 28th of February. So a bunch of the money prior to the Pearl Lopez, like the, the Wea money, the Fabio Silva money, with the definitely, and then the Efra Alvarez money, that would have pretty much all went towards uh, the Larson acquisition, which was obviously a really big pickup for the, for the platform, not for the platform, I beg your pardon, for the, for the club. Um, and then even the Henry Kessler as well, going and getting him to bolster my under 23 defence options, even though that's not really kicked in for me this year. But... As I say, when I'm releasing these guys, and there's the door shove now, got 0.124, you know, so I, I think I've done pretty well out of that. Um, and then, when did Key come in? Did maybe some of this fund Key? Key came in on the 4th of April, so probably not. So I've had one page where the actual trades, in hindsight, were rubbish, and, I, you know, looking at the... They didn't, they've not they've not aged well, you know, but the ETH that I acquired went into Nemeca, and Nemeca has been very good, so I can forgive myself for that. This page here, the trades have all been very good, and as you can see, the, the buys I've made off the back of it have been a bit more tactical for the club. The Stekelenberg trades have been very profitable in terms of I bought Stekelenberg and sold him in a high and then bought Katarski and bought Sherpin and sold Sherpin high and bought an R Stekelenberg and you know, had a bit of fun with Ajax's goalkeepers this year. Now this page guys is also full of some good trades I managed to pull off. The majority of them are rewards which is lovely. So starting from the Cavallini, that was like end of March. I just checked the dates, I think it was like 25th or something. And then as you can see between him Sakamoto, uh, Hasegawa was a rubbish reward. I can't believe somebody actually bought him off me, to be honest with you. Alex Grimaldo, Albin Lafont, who I was just kind of done with, to be honest with you. Um, Paolo Lobe, uh, Mario, Alan Polito. Now, Gian Mario, I'd actually sold him for like actual football cards. I kept a Phil Foden rookie and I sold the rest of them for like 250 quid or something. So I think I did okay on that. Alan Polito, Bjorn Johnson, Mark Rocca, Maxime Krapal, and then Prejimola Frankowski, as you can see towards the bottom here. Um, and then I say I've loaned Hendo um, Amensa, sold a Kral and Eric Williamson and a Rio Hutate. So um, over that period there, a lot of these rewards, that, you know, Rocca wasn't a reward per se. And the other was some oh, anyway, some of these guys are rewards and some of these guys I'd bought to let them ripen. And as you can see here from Cavallini, point two, Sakamoto, uh, I'm just gonna tell these up as I go. So point four three, point four six five, point six eight five. So we're then adding on six eight five and seven. So about a coin and a half. Hendo taking the Pearl Obe that I'd got a doubler of. It's just over two ETH. The Polito two and a half, the Bjorn Johnson two and six seven, that Rocca gets me to two seven five. I'm then getting over three ETH with the Krapal, and then I'm then getting close to three and a half with the Frankowski. And as you'll remember, you know I stacked up a lot of ETH towards the end of March and the beginning of April. I went and spent one point six of it on a key, which has backfired on me immensely. But I also went and picked up a lot of super rares in April through May, and a lot of that ETH had came from some of these guys, MLS guys about to kick off their season, rewards I'd pulled that I hadn't really fancied, but again, every one of those names as I mentioned them to you, you are probably familiar with Alex Grimaldo, you're probably familiar with Cavallini, Sakamoto, Paolo Lobe, Bjorn Johnson, Maxime Krapal, Frankowski, 
these are all names. Even Eric Williamson and Rio Hitate. Rio Hitate, by the way, is a big slap in the face now. Sold him well too cheap. Um, even for as recently as it was. I just... Um, I, it, the thing with Rio Hitate is I know he's OP because he's an out of position forward or whatever, but he's so in and out of the team on rotation. It's a headache I just didn't want to deal with anymore. So, where did Rio Hitate go? Sorry, 18th of May. So, not even that long ago. Like, six weeks ago. Um... And again, these are all names you're going to be familiar with. So these guys are market pieces. These are guys that when you put into the market, they are guys that you don't need to explain who they are to anyone. If you're going into Discord or if you're jumping into DMs with folk or into Telegram or Reddit or any of these different places and you're saying, oh, I'm trying to move my Denzel Dumfries or I'm trying to move my Rio Hitati or this guy or that guy, people know who you're talking about, you know. And there's going to be people that are like, oh, do you know what? I was actually thinking about buying him last week and I didn't have enough ETH, but now we're doing this guy's trying to sell. Can we do a deal? Oh, I can see that guy also was trying to buy a X. I've got that guy. Can we maybe do a trade, you know, that kind of thing. Um, So I would definitely keep your eyes open for these types of cards. And when you are building your rosters out, because I know a lot of you guys out there are going to be building your teams now for the European season is kicking off, please try and have that in mind that at some point you may want to dispense with one of these cards. And if it is an absolute no-name who doesn't come into form, doesn't come into any sort of SO5 credence, then you might struggle to move them on point blank, never mind flip them for a profit if that's your agenda with some of these acquisitions. But some of these guys that have a profile, you know, Rio Hotati, I was just talking about there, is a rotation merchant and it's absolutely painful, but he has a profile. Same with guys like Polito, Krapal, um, Cavallini, all these guys have a profile. If people go searching for players, these are names that will pop up on their radar. And whether it tickles everyone's pickle, is another thing and that's what will fluctuate on players demand is all oh, the forms about to turn or he's just back from injury or his hot is a, his form is amazing i need him in my team for this game week coming then that's what stimulates the demand and what will ebb and flow the demand as cycles go through the market but if you as i say if you are just building your team up with a bunch of no names that are average 30s to 40 guys that don't have any real history of big scores good scores i've never got any kind of transfer history or you know anything like this then you will find yourself landed with some stuff that is really difficult to move you know um and that will demoralize you and like i said before in other videos when you do get demoralized with the market it makes it really hard to make sensible decisions with that page of really bad trades that i showed you what was happening at that point if you remember going december to january is ETH was just going up and up and up and up and up and i was sitting thinking shit man like the best ETH rates for some of these guys might be today because if ETH was, keeps blowing up the way it does, then I won't get this same ETH rate <clears throat> that I could get today. And if it keeps going up and up and up and then the super rares are coming out, like you've seen me actually action, you know, like the Nemeca, the Larson, the Key, the Nunes, whatever, then I'm not going to be able to capitalise on these opportunities. So as much as I've made tons of mistakes in the last year, I think I've came out of pretty much all of them um, smelling like roses, which is nice. But the part of that is I'm winning rewards and the guys I am selling into the market and I'm trying to do deals with are good players. You know, I'm not trying to flog anyone any shit. And as you've seen in those direct offers, there's no card in there that is like, oh Jesus, you sold that guy for that much. You have ripped somebody off because no one, anyone who plays so rare has a level of football knowledge, it has to be said at this stage in time. So you're never going to be able to rip anyone off even if you wanted to. And it, the best way to be in the marketplace, guys, any direct dealings I've had with people, I would like to think I'm a relative pleasure to deal with. You know, I'm not unreasonable and I don't ask for the earth and try and give you fuck all back for it. Um, so if I can complete deals that work for all in a, a time efficient manner, then I can get ETH into my wallet. I can step into that auction of mine up or I can make a withdrawal maybe. You know, if you're actually looking at maybe just, you know what, the club's grown so much, I've picked up all these rewards. Let me now just take a little step back maybe pocket some cash maybe let's just sit on a wee bit of a balance and see if anything pops up in the auctions over the next week or two the type of profile i'm looking for is this or that um and as i say it becomes much easier with market pieces most of the market pieces they, if i was to make a list of ideal guys most of them will be under 23 because most of us are pre-programmed in football to look for the rookie to look for the wonder kid to look for the hot prospect the guy that's up and coming and that's what most people look for when they join a platform like so rare. So if you can get a couple of these guys that do pop up on top 50 wonder kid in Europe lists or top 10 guys to watch out for next season list, that kind of thing, then you're buying a guy that will have exposure in the football sphere to so rare managers that might pick him up and go, oh, 
I bet you nobody's seen that yet, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and if you're holding the guy and you've bought him cheap, you can sell him for a bit more. Then that's that's the kind of trades that you want to have in the club um, to make yourself fluid to market changes and to be able to get yourself into a position where you can capitalise upon opportunities, okay? So, as well as it's all well and good building your team and everything as well, guys, when you're building your club, and I mean building your club, with this series, this is episode four, um, Lee did I mind you, so make sure if you've not checked out episode one to three, you go and do that. But when you're building your storeware club, there's some boxes you need to tick along the way, and this is one of them. Make sure you've got pieces in your club that are S that are market pieces that you can drop into Discord right now, and you know you'll get some DMs and interest of. Um, and again, equally, if you are going to be looking to trade up, those are the kind of guys that people will accept. You know, if you're looking to go trade a bunch of rares for a super rare, for example, if the rares you're trying to shift in are guys that play and can be useful at D4, maybe even D3 level, then that trade has some legs to it. But if you're trying to just dish out all your shite and guys that don't play and guys that are about to retire and are always injured and whatever, then those trades never happen. And if you are looking to make those steps up, then those market pieces are, can be the ones you can buy cheap when they're out of season, when they're injured, when the manager doesn't like them, whatever. Wait for them hit form and then this guy you've picked up for buttons is now worth something and you can maybe let you can maybe um, um, leverage that against a bit of ETH and buy a super rare off somebody and then for example now boom you managed to pick up a card for next to nothing net because of how cheap you've picked up the market piece initially and maybe whatever you've done else with the ETH maybe you've sold a market piece previously to, to realise that ETH you know and these are the trades that will really help your club move on and step up through the ranks of SO5 and the so rare kind of world if that makes sense hope you've enjoyed this video guys um, I, I love going through this and kind of showing you some real examples of some stuff I've done good things and bad things uh, the d next double header of this I say will be episode 5 of how to build your club and it's going to be called um, club assets okay so look forward to that coming out later this week um, I hope you enjoyed the game week uh, as well I hope you enjoyed the live stream last night so thanks very much for joining me if you did um, like subscribe share retweet all that good stuff guys stay out of trouble and I'll catch you on the next one take care bye bye